subtitle for this talk might be why does a Type 45 destroyer or any modern warship look like it does? And by the end of part two, the answer may be a little bit clearer, hopefully. So first, we'll consider the threat to surface ships. The Pacific Air War demonstrated that ships could be seriously damaged by aircraft, particularly those with suicidal intent. Kamikazes were very hard to defeat. They were single-minded. They were keen on getting through. And even when they were successfully engaged, the inbound debris cloud had enough momentum to cause significant damage. After World War II, the logical extension of the kamikaze for most nations was the unmanned anti-ship missile. And most belligerents during World War II had prototypes under wartime development, and some of these were brought to fruition in the early Cold War years. The first attempt, um, typified by the uh, Soviet AS-1 Kennel, shown in the bottom left here, this was based on a modified MiG-15 fighter jet shape, because the Soviets knew that that flew and flew quite well, um, slightly slimmed down and configured for remote control. And this could be carried by medium range bombers to within about 100 kilometers of the target ship and then released to fly a, a variety of uh, flight profiles towards the target ship. After release, it would be guided by its own radar and you can see its own radar above the air intake at the front of the, uh, the missile there. And it would choose a radar return within its field of view as its target and lock onto that and home towards it. It was a pretty large missile because it was almost the size of a, a manned fighter plane. It was large enough to carry a very substantial conventional warhead or even a first generation nuclear payload. So a single hit from one of those missiles would certainly uh, cause, uh, cause your day to get a little bit worse than it had been before. Smaller missiles were soon developed and uh, Notable one is Styx missile and its derivatives, um, which you can see on the right there. This equipped aircraft, surface ships and land-based launchers. And Styx missiles give small patrol boats like the OSA, illustrated here, the hitting power of a battleship broadside with four missiles contained in, in launchers in a small patrol boat. The air threat at the target could actually originate from air, surface, land or subsurface launchers. And operational plans, as they were developed by the, the, the Russians and by the Western nations, called ideally for multi-axis attacks against the target, launching missiles outside of a naval defended zone, trying to achieve simultaneous time on target to saturate any defences. However, the early missiles flew quite slowly. They sometimes needed mid-course guidance. They were vulnerable to errors in their primitive guidance control, and they didn't always work reliably. However, um, missiles developed, and Exocet is the classic example that was developed in the, uh, in the 60s for deployment in the 70s. It was faster than the, the Styx missile. It had a longer range. It was much more portable, smaller diameter, um, much easier to use, and had increased autonomy. Exocet was developed by the French, as we know. Um, it was exported worldwide, and uh, notably to Argentina and to Iraq and, uh, and to China as well. And this small diameter missile was designed to fly very, very low once it had been launched to avoid visual and radar detection. And you can see on the right here, a, a typical flight profile. As soon as the missile is launched, it bunts upwards just to clear the, the ship and then dives down towards sea skimming height. Typically for a missile like Exocet, a launch platform, whether it was an aircraft, a ship or a submarine, would stay outside the detection range of the target ship it would get intelligence information about where the target was, and then would probably use its own radar to get a rough idea of the location of the target. Exocet would then be fired in that general direction. As the missile progressed, it would travel at sea skimming height, slowly reducing altitude as it got closer to the target. The final altitude depended on the, the sea state of the day in question. And it would stay ideally below the visual and the radar horizon of the target. And crucially, during this phase, the launch platforms and the missile maintained radio silence so that they wouldn't give away their position. Only when it was a few kilometers from the preset target position would the Exocet turn on its own radar seeker in the, in the nose of the missile, build its own map of target locations, and then autonomously select the best target to hit, um, hitting a couple of meters above the waterline. And on striking the target, a warhead can be detonated, obviously, uh, shrapnel can pierce unarmored bulkheads, 
And any unburnt fuel within the missile can cause additional fire damage. And we we had a talk last year about uh, USS Stark and the uh, damage that was caused by uh, two Exocet hits then. Damage from a single small missile might not sink a target, but would probably prevent it from fighting on. And we've got some impacts here of uh, UK warships, a county class destroyer on the left and a, a Type 22 frigate on the right, both hit in sink X, uh, sink exercises when they were, were surplus for use in the Royal Navy, and we used as targets. Um, both of these, I think, were uh, harpoon rather than next set uh, missile impacts, but they're uh, illustrative of the sort of damage that could be done by a single missile. In plan view, um, a simple, very simple-minded missile might work by scanning perhaps left to right once it turns on its own radar and locking onto the first target that it sees. Uh, that would be a very, very basic logic that could uh, be managed with a few transistors in the, in the seeker head. Possibly, if you put a little bit more logic into the seeker head, you could get it to search for the biggest target that was within its field of view and lock onto that, or maybe some other kind of um, logic which allowed it to um, select the target that you found um, most likely to be the target of interest. Ideally, you would... As a, as a missile designer, I want the missile to home onto the, the most valuable target, maybe a carrier or a transport ship. Really strong radar reflections come from physically large slabs of metal, like the size of a ship, or from right angle corners. So the largest ship in view, or maybe the one with the most clutter on deck, might be the one most likely to be targeted and hit. And target barges for radar guided missile trials, such as this one here, which is a, a Russian example, they're absolutely festooned with corner cubes. Uh, they're very familiar items for any modern yachtsman keen to make his vessel show up on radar because a, a triple flat plate corner cube like that gives a very, very strong re reflection back in the direction from which the radar signal has come. And by and large, warships until the mid 70s really didn't pay an awful lot of attention to um, radar cross-section and the, the, the hygiene of the, the, the deck clutter. So something like a, a refueling ship like this one here, um, Black Rover in this case, in, in the top right, had many, many right angle corners and many, many um, opportunities for radar to be reflected right back to the, uh, the targeting missile or the targeting aircraft. Clearly, you don't want your high value logistics unit or your carriers to be, be targeted. The missile doesn't have to use radar for its guidance. It could use uh, other means of um, guidance. It could use TV, infrared, uh, heat seeking, um, or even passively home in on the radar emissions from the target ship itself. And cunning missile designers might even build multiple means of guidance. So if you had a, a missile which had the ability to use a radar and an infrared seeker, it would complicate the defenses uh, in trying to overcome the, uh, the logic of that seeker head. And even more threatening are supersonic missiles, and those with some form of cooperative mode of attack, where you may have a swarm of missiles working together to try and uh, uh, attack a, a target or a task group. So modern anti-ship missiles pose a very serious threat to even the largest warships. Manned aircraft are also a threat, but generally pilots would um, prefer to engage with standoff weapons, such as missiles, so they don't have to close on a defended target. However, missiles are very expensive, and cheap drones launched from land or small boats might now be employed with significant effect. And if hundreds of drones can be coordinated to produce a light show, such as the, the one over South Sea when we had the uh, D-Day celebrations last year, um, just think what a, a coordinated set of drones could do when swarming a, a modern warship. Um, each individual one might be very small with a small, um, small explosive charge on it, but if they're coordinated together in an intelligent manner, that can uh, form a very, very significant threat to a warship, especially near coastlines where control of drone swarms might be easier. And we'll talk a little bit more about drones next, next uh, uh, in the next presentation. So, so much for the threat. How does a warship go about detecting and identifying a credible threat? If we look at any warship over the last 70 years, we'll usually see a vast collection of antennas dotted around the superstructure and the masts. Given the attack profile of a typical missile that we saw earlier, then passive listening to the electromagnetic spectrum can warn when hostile radio or radar is first being used. So in our early example, for example, if the aircraft and the ship um, 
starting to make an attack, we're receiving communications from from a, a land base that could be intercepted and hopefully uh, decoded and understood, or maybe their own radar emissions could be detected by by the warship. This capability is termed electronic support measures. It's part of electronic warfare. And ESM antennas can be spotted uh, very easily on warships. Uh, generally, just look for repeated items giving a 360 degree coverage. And if we look at the uh, Type 23 frigates on the right there, you can see the, the sort of spiky array just below the, the main radar at the top of the mast there. So that spiky array is an array of um, radar receivers, which allow you to detect radars emitted from aircraft or ships um, from a, a significant distance away. And there's obviously an array of them to give a, a full azimuth or uh, coverage. And they're different sizes depending on the uh, frequency of radar being detected. With the right lookup library, once you've detected those, those um, potentially hostile radar signals, it is possible to determine the type of radar being seen and what it is doing. So, for example, you can determine whether an aircraft radar is um, just generally searching or navigating or whether it's actually pointing at you and locking onto you and trying to uh, target you as a, as a threat. But you need intelligence in order to understand that sort of behavior. And uh, Navy spend a lot of effort trying to understand um, the electromagnetic spectrum and the kind of signals they might see in a, in a potentially hostile environment in order to prepare themselves for battle in the future should hostilities commence. However, intercepting uh, radar and radio signals only gives you bearing, it doesn't give you range. It can tell you that uh, a threat is maybe over to the west, but it can't tell you whether it's 30 miles away or 100 miles away. Another sensor on board is clearly radar. Uh, radars can detect targets and plot their positions over time. Um, it can't directly yield identity, but can provide a track sufficiently um, robust enough to determine threatening behavior. So for example, it can determine whether a, an aircraft is turning towards and heading towards you as a, as a potentially threatening gesture, or whether it's turning away and is, is maybe a benign, benign air target. Radars can also guide defensive measures such as anti-ship missiles uh, and anti-air missiles or gun systems. So um, guns can be uh, trained and targeted towards an inbound threat using radar information. Different radars are needed for different phases of an engagement and also for different target types. Large, broad radars provide bearing information. Tall, thin radars, such as the one in the, the middle picture there, are height finders. They provide very good height information, but very little azimuthal information. Long wavelengths can be used to detect stealthy targets at range, but with poor position information. The top right picture is a Chinese um, low frequency, long wavelength counter stealth radar. And you see that sort of array on most uh, Chinese warships these days. It looks like a, a collection of television antennas, and that's essentially what it is. Shorter wavelengths can provide much more precision, uh, but can't reach out so far. So a warship generally has a number of different radars on it, uh, performing different functions, and all that information has to be fused somewhere in the, the command information system within the ship to form a, a complete air picture. Besides radars, we also have optical sensors. Either the Mark I eyeball of a traditional lookout or an enhanced binocular, TV or infrared system. And so you can see on a type 45 on the left there, a couple of circled elements, which are uh, uh, optical and infrared uh, sensors, uh, cameras that are on, on the bridge roof of the type 45. There's a similar sort of arrangement on the type 23 uh, circled on the, the front of the mast there. Generally, these allow you to uh, zoom in and uh, track a target somewhere away, but obviously um, in poor weather or if it's foggy or, or there's obscurance in the, in the air, you can't see quite as far as well. So in the end, all these sensors are continually feeding information to the ship's crew. They have to make sense of the picture that uh, they're building. They have to take into account intelligence about the global and local situation. They have to look at radar, optical, and, uh, and electronic sensing information. And once they've combined all that, they try to build an air picture. 
what they do about that is is the subject of the next talk, but that's really um, very much constrained by the rules of engagement, which would depend on the state of play of the uh, the world at the time, whether we're in a peaceful situation or a transition towards war. Also, there is inherent ambiguity in most of what goes on. And in many cases, the fog of war, or the fog of peace plays a part. You may have lots of air targets. You may only be able to identify some of them. Others, you might have to spend a lot of time looking at to determine whether they're uh, exhibiting threatening behavior or not. You try and build that picture up from all the information you get from the ship sensors. Once you do that, you might be able to do something about the, the items out there that are the real threats to you. So to conclude the talk for this week, if we have a look at the Type 45 destroyer, the model here, we begin to see why some of the elements of the Type 45 destroyer are, are shaped as they are and the way they're placed as they are. So on the, uh, on the rear mast, you've got long range radar, which is used for long range surveillance, very good azimuth coverage, not a brilliant height finder, but it can tell you what is out there at long range, give you plenty of warming. The sphere on the top of the foremast is uh, tracking radar. So if the long range radar detects something which might be of interest or might be a threat, you can use that to cue the tracking radar to uh, interrogate it more deeply and, uh, and track it more precisely in case you need to engage it. We have the, the electronic support measures, the, the listening sensors on the foremast. You've got the, the sort of spiky array going around the foremast. You've got similar arrays on the, uh, the pole mast as well. The, the ones on the pole mast are from lower frequencies, more communications uh, signals rather than radar signals. And on the bridge roof, as we saw before, you've got electro-optic sensors. So that really sums up most of the, the sensor suites on the Type 45 destroyer and begins to show you why that they're there and uh, the, the kind of things that might be used to build a picture within the command information center within the, the destroyer itself. When we uh, look next week uh, or next month rather at, uh, at uh, what we do about the threat, we'll understand a bit more about some of the other items on the, on the Type 45. And I'd like to stop there, thank you.